happening. Um, and this is kind of a general question. Um, so whoever feels most compelled to, to answer, please do so. Um, <clears throat> I've heard the description of an Asian population. There was a study from Shanghai Hospital. Um, and pan-ethnic designations, from my point of view, can be very dangerous uh, because they can skew the information that results from a study. So we had the Swedish, the Scandinavian SOS study, an Asian study, predominance of, of obesity uh, in, in, in female populations. But I haven't seen, among any of the presentations, uh, data that makes it a little more granular and drills down. Um, so something, if you're in Mexico, you have a corn-based diet. If you're in the Dominican or Cuban, you've got a rice-based diet. I don't know how those variables or potential confounders uh, play into the data that's been presented. So if someone has some information, they can dice and slice and, and give me a better I insight into which populations are most likely to benefit, so the ones with disabilities that we've seen, I'd, I'd much appreciate it. And then we're going to go down the line um, in sequence. Anybody want to feel that one? Sure. No, yeah, please come to the microphone. <clears throat> and when speaking, could you please state your name for the, um, for the record? Uh, Ranjan Sudan, uh, Duke University. Thank you very much for the question. Looking at the same database uh, from the bariatric uh, uh, society, uh, we looked at ethnicity and the relationship of ethnicity, both with regards to how many people from various uh, ethnic groups were getting the bariatric operation, uh, we also looked at what the benefit was in terms of comorbidity resolution, weight loss, and then this study that looked at reoperations also looked at ethnicity. So what we found was that pretty much all ethnic groups get benefit. African Americans tend to uh, have a little uh, worse resolution of comorbidity compared to uh, Caucasians when it comes to <laughs> hypertension uh, as well as weight loss. Uh, the number of African Americans who are getting reoperations also tends to be higher than the number of folks who are getting primary operations. It goes up from about 12% to 15%. Uh, so 12% are getting primary operations and 15% are getting reoperations. The ethnic group that seems to do the best is actually the Hispanics because they have about 6% of the folks who are getting operations. Uh, they get good weight loss, good, co -res uh, good resolution of comorbidity, and their reoperation rates correspondingly in the second study actually tend to be lower. I don't know if that answers your no, question. No, that, that helps. And Thank we're going to go on down the line, as I said before. Please reintroduce sure. yourself. I'm Karen Albright, and I'm from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Um, I had a couple of things, so I'll start with the first one. Um, my understanding, um, based on the presentations and the uh, recommended reading, is that one of the, I guess, cornerstone studies for longer-term data is the SOS study. And um, my read of that is that 89% of those operations were open. And I was wondering if someone could speak to what's going on in the United States now compared to that. Um, also on that, my understanding is that the most common or one of the most common procedures is one that's not done here anymore the vertical banded gastroplasty. I was wondering if someone could help me equate that to what's happening here in current practice. Thank you, Eric DiMaria um, from Richmond. I'll try to address that for you. Uh, there's been a tremendous shift in the access techniques used for bariatric surgery in the United States and in fact around the world. Uh, you're correct uh, from your observations of the data that the SOS trial was mostly open surgery. Of course, it was procedures performed in, a, in an era where we didn't have really advanced laparoscopic surgery. Um, the, uh, the incidence of laparoscopic surgery in the United States today is, is the predominant technique. It's uh, well over 90% of all procedures. 
and then specifically the <clears throat> procedure that is in fact no longer done, the vertical banded gastroplasty, which did comprise a, a large portion of the SOS uh, study population. Uh, that procedure uh, has fallen by the wayside for several factors. Uh, one is that some long-term follow-up studies suggested it wasn't as durable in terms of weight loss. Another was the advent of the adjustable gastric band, uh, which is a, I, I'll use the terminology I, I discredited a little bit, restrictive procedure. Uh, both are restrictive procedures and the lap uh, adjustable gastric band could be reliably placed laparoscopically. So uh, there was an evolution, I think, away from the vertical banded gastroplasty because of those factors. So would it be a stretch to say that what you're describing is progress and it might result in lower adverse event rates or lower complication rates? There, there have been head-to-head -head comparisons of laparoscopic to open surgery and there is no uh, doubt that laparoscopic provides uh, lower adverse event rates, particularly in the area of wound-related problems. Uh, the uh, population that we operate on uh, is prone to having uh, wound infections and hernias develop with large wounds, and laparoscopic surgery really minimizes that uh, risk. Okay. Um, and then I just had one more thing, um, probably more of a comment than anything. Um, SOS, to my understanding, is a, was a prospective intervention, but there was no randomization. So, so that sort of speaks to your point about confounders. Well, and, and, and I'd appreciate the opportunity to comment upon that because the idea of randomization was uh, very fully discussed and investigated at the time. Uh, and I think this points out to the greater issue of randomization for surgical procedure versus no surgical procedure. It was actually felt to be unethical to randomize patients to an invasive procedure in that era. Now, we have obviously gotten away from that to some extent, but you'll notice that most of the randomized trials involve the adjustable gastric band. Right. So, so um, I think people ethically have taken this very seriously. The idea, you know, is it really fair to randomize people to surgery versus no surgery? And that's one of the reasons that we don't have many randomized trials. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me for now. Doug Campus Halt called Phoenix, Arizona, University of Arizona College of Public Health. Um, first of all, I have a couple comments. I really want to compliment the uh, network that's really working on quality improvement. Um, I think that that's very impressive, and I, I was very happy to see that. I'm also very happy to see the data that's being collected um, and uh, the rigorousness of which that's being done. It makes me wish that I was facing the questions I'm facing today five years from now, um, because I think we would have a much better data set uh, to address them. So uh, I just want to make that comment. Um, throughout the presentations, I, I've noticed there are a number of things which, uh, as an evidence-based background person, I didn't see that I would have liked to have seen. For instance, I would like to have seen absolute rate reductions, not relative ones. I would have liked to have heard more about number needed to treat uh, to achieve outcomes, and I would have liked to have um, uh, seen a lot more about the loss to follow-up. So just, that's just a comment in terms of some of the quality of the evidence um, that, that I saw. Um, now, I'm going to follow all that with an attempt to upgrade the level of evidence by pressing a little bit the, the, the team that did the evidence report. So the series of questions uh, will be, will be uh, aimed at those two people whose names I can't pronounce, okay? so I apologize for that. So I'm wondering in the evidence report, um, did you take into consideration, first of all, magnitude of effect? Uh, because that's one of the ways you can upgrade studies observational studies is that there's large magnitude of effect. So that's question number one. Question number two, did you look at publication bias? Um, seems to me with observational studies of, of the kind we're looking at, there's a real potential for publication bias here, and I'd like to uh, have that commented on. And then um, uh, heterogeneity. I'd like to know whether you assessed any of those three things and, and perhaps could have upgraded the quality of evidence on some of the questions a bit by uh, having 
not very much heterogeneity, having a fairly large magnitude of effect and no publication bias being found. So I just would like comment, uh, you to comment on those questions. Uh, my name is Orestes Panagiotu from Brown University. Um, I will address the, your concerns about uh, the technology assessment and the systematic review. Uh, the first one pertains to whether we address the magnitude of effect size as um, uh, a criterion to upgrade uh, the evidence. Uh, so we applied all the uh, guidance, all the grades and the, the strategies that are included in the um, ARC uh, EPC guide about how to evaluate the strength of evidence. And uh, uh, to the extent that this was available and we could apply this to studies, we did so when we uh, evaluated the strength of evidence. Uh, your second question was uh, about uh, publication bias. And heterogeneity. And heterogeneity. I think these, uh, these two questions fall uh, under uh, the umbrella of uh, statistical synthesis of the evidence. And particularly because when we saw the studies, uh, we saw that uh, different uh, populations are compared and different uh, interventions are compared. We had studies, for example, that compared surgery versus non-surgery, surgery versus uh, orthopedic bariatric surgery versus orthopedic surgery, and ortho, uh, bariatric surgery versus uh, GI surgeries. So these three types of uh, studies, although the outcome was uh, similar, all-cause mortality, they are too heterogeneous clinically to be combined into a meaningful estimate. So by applying a priori our uh, clinical criteria about what would be a homogeneous or exchangeable, exchangeable sample of studies that we could uh, operate on and perform a meta-analysis. We did not do, do so, and that's why we did not measure heterogeneity in the formal sense. And that's also the reason that we did not address publication bias through meta-regressions or other approaches. And also for most of the forest plots that I showed, even if we were able to do some kind of quantitative synthesis, uh, for the majority of outcomes we had two or, th or three studies, which meant that the publication bias test would be very un underpowered to detect uh, any association between effect sizes and uh, uh, sample sizes. And I am the second one with an unspeakable name. <laughs> and, and, uh, yes. So. Uh, another thing that I should like to add is that the, the way that you can uh, uh, shield an analysis from publication bias is to try to identify to the extent possible all the evidence that you can identify that uh, is unpublished but is accessible through registries, prospective registries and so on. And we have done an extensive search to try to identify these, these sources of information. Uh, that being said, publication bias is a threat to any synthesis of the evidence, be it a systematic review, be it a narrative review, or, or anything else. And uh, <coughs> it becomes the, the concerns that you raised about uh, descriptions of heterogeneity and, and uh, addressing publication bias are, are, uh, are in some sense tangential to a lot of the conclusions that we draw because we have very few n studies for, for specific comparisons and for specific interventions. So if you have a lot of different comparisons for lo a lot of different outcomes and only two or three or at most four studies that address this particular thing, questions about quantifying heterogeneity and questions about modeling treatment effects uh, versus study characteristics are, are, are good to think about but are, are impractical to address. You, you cannot really address that unless you have a meta-analysis, let's say, of, of 10, 20 studies. I, I, if this is not clear, I, I'm happy to, to continue on that. Uh, Matt Hutter, um, I spoke earlier of Mass General Hospital. I just want to make, with regards to your comment, with regards to the data collection program, we're very excited about the data that we're collecting and the future information that we will have. Um, it was comment before that the data is not accessible. Now it is. A participant use file has been released. It's for any participant to use for all the data that we capture from that standpoint. So we're looking forward to getting that out there. With 180,000 new cases being collected every year, we have a lot of heterogeneity of treatment effect that we can look at in the subgroup analysis. So very powerful data. Not only look for procedures being done today, and as you can see with the rapid turnover in procedures, we don't do the vertical banded gastroplasty. The, the band, the lap band, which is a good procedure, but it's being done less. The sleeve gastrectomy wasn't even being done in measurable numbers in 2007. But since we have the facility with this data collection program to add 
we look at the new process, the new data collection programs going forward. So we're very excited about that as well. Nice. Yes. With your data collection tool, do you have um, the ability, and, and if so, how easy or difficult would it be to add variables? And one thing that strikes me is we're talking about chronologic, chronological age, but not really physiologic age. And so I think all of us have taken care of a 65-year-old, 70-year-old, 75-year-old who plays tennis, which is very different to say someone else who is their same age. And so it, it strikes me that a database like that would benefit from mm -hmm. having something like frailty, where we had a, you know, something that you can, it has been associated and correlated with outcomes in older Americans. Great, great question. Uh, we update the data collection program every six months. We make recommendations for new data collection points or we make obsolete ones go away because of the data burden from that. Frailty is extremely important. The NSQIP, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, is our sister, our sister uh, data collection program. And lessons learned from right now, they're exploring frailty. What they learned, we can easily add to the MBSA QIP. So I think that is a key question that we look forward to adding and including. We do look at other things. It's, you know, this is quality improvement. It's not a research tool, first and foremost. We'd love to, I would love to add a lot of other questions, but we have to focus on some. We did find that functional status using walkers, canes, crutches as a surrogate actually has a lot of explanatory uh, power with regards to comorbidities. Thank you. <laughs> Just a real quick addition to address Dr. Albright's question is that uh, we are currently undergoing a, revi a review of the data collection and, and payer status is highly likely. We haven't finalized it, so we should be able to, uh, to do analysis of, of CMS and other payer status uh, in the near future. Okay. <coughs> Dr. Mora. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Mora from Kaiser Permanente in Washington, and this question is for uh, Dr. DeMaria. Uh, I was uh, obviously impressed, and you put a lot of time and effort into pulling together all the information that we looked at in terms of the evidence tables. One of the questions I have is a lot of that was in the commercial population under 65, and I'm interested in how do you think about it from a leadership or from a clinical standpoint in terms of extrapolating that data to the Medicare population, recognizing that we did hear at least some work around a large, uh, large cohort, I guess, or case series of Medicare patients who had the operation who were actually under 65. Um, but I'm interested in your sort of leadership clinical perspective about extrapolating that information to the Medicare population. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to comment specifically on that issue. Uh, and I think we heard some of the statistics uh, in various uh, formats this morning. Uh, Medicare, uh, as a payer, is a minority of the patients that we treat in the United States today uh, with bariatric surgery, um, ranging in the 3 to 5 percent range. So it's a small subgroup, uh, for sure. Um, it's an illusion to believe that they're elderly, because two-thirds of the Medicare-insured patients are disabled, younger patients. and they're, age does not differ t from the typical bariatric surgery population that we're very familiar uh, with treating. Um, but that's an important population because of the disability component. Uh, and sometimes there are most challenging patients, which is why uh, looking at these safety numbers that we can present to you now from our clinically rich database is so important to see that in the mix, we have such high levels of safety and low mortality uh, in that population when it's mixed in. Um, so it is a bit of a challenge to select out the Medicare population and to really understand the outcomes. We've seen studies of patients of higher age groups with bariatric surgery. Just to reemphasize, they tend to have more comorbidities than younger patients. Um, they tend, quite honestly, in my view, to have somewhat less weight loss, uh, but good comorbidity improvement, which after all, at least um, our experience is that the older age group is very driven by comorbidity. It's less of an issue if they can get into a nice bathing suit at the age of 70, but more driven by the concerns about diabetes and other health problems. So, it is a challenge, but we have a very powerful tool to use in treatment of these patients. And, uh, you know, we, we'd like to do a better job 
providing outcomes data on the Medicare population, but CMS did make a decision a few years ago to not require accreditation for centers treating these patients, and that has probably removed some of our ability to provide information about that population. That's good. That's helpful. Thank you. So a follow-up question as well, um, and for a different, uh, different experts. So thank you, sir. Uh, so in follow-up to Dr. Panagatu and Trinka Linus, see, I didn't have any trouble pronouncing those names, <laughs> although I don't think I did correctly. Um, on the other hand, you cautioned against extrapolating the data to the commercial population. I'd really like to hear a little bit more about why. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to try to address this question and provide our thoughts. Uh, actually, this is something that we have thought a lot when we were uh, refining the key questions for the technology assessment. Uh, we went back to the literature to see what exists, what other systematic uh, uh, reviews uh, have already performed, what uh, gaps we can address that other studies did, uh, did not capture. Um, I, we believe that uh, there is the question of extensibility of patients who are younger but not covered by Medicare and patients who are younger but are covered. And most of them would, be, would have some kind of disability that qualifies them for um, Medicare uh, eligibility. Um, from our clinical perspective, and by discussing this with our clinical experts, we felt that these two populations are not directly exchangeable, and we cannot really make inferences about the effectiveness or safety in a younger commercial population who might be relatively healthy uh, to those who might be uh, not healthy and have disabilities uh, and other comorbidities that make them eligible for Medicare. And uh, these effects could have been very much different. Uh, there are statistical ways to address those concerns, mm -hmm. uh, but this is, is not something that is typically done in systematic reviews because it requires us having individual patient data to try to generate distributions of comorbidities in two different populations and try to predict effect sizes. Uh, so that was our main, uh, the main criterion about, or our main thoughts about how these two populations performed. Okay, I would also like to uh, clarify here that we did not exclude younger patients as long as a study either had Medicare populations regardless of uh, reasons for them being entitled to Medicare benefits, these were uh, included, but these were only seven studies. And we also included three studies that specifically mentioned uh, our patients had some degree of disability, some um, form of disability, and uh, we performed bariatric surgery. Some of them actually looked at resolution of disabilities before and after surgery. So we captured uh, with our search and criteria a population that uh, assembles or resembles uh, medical population as close as possible without having to do statistical extrapolations across different uh, groups of patients. That's great, thank you. Good, and then I just have, I just have a... Follow up yeah. on that. I'm sorry. I just wanted to know: is that 55 age? Is that a median, a mean, or a minimum? Uh, that was uh, either a mean or a median, uh, depending on what other studies, uh, what the study was reported. Not all of them reported both. Um, depends on how the age is distributed and what people decide to report. Thank you. And I just have one quick last final question, and this question is for Dr. Arterburn and his team. One of the slides that really struck me was the slide that showed that in one region, 80% of the time, the best surgeons in that region chose one operation. And in another region, 80% of the time, the best <laughs> surgeons in that region chose a different operation. And I'm interested in understanding what's your expert opinion or view on the impact that that has in Medicare members. Uh, David Arterburn from Kaiser Permanente Washington. Thanks, Mark. I think the, um, the answer to that is that it's probably uh, driven not only by some surgeon uh, influence on which procedures are being done, but there's also payer influence there in terms of which procedures are being covered. Um, and, and so what can be offered to the, the patient at the time. And um, you know, given, I think, em emerging data, some data presented today, that there's different weight loss and comorbidity outcomes across the different procedures. If a surgical group is really leaning heavily towards one particular procedure over another one, they are likely ignoring patient preferences 
around different issues related to comorbidity improvement and resolution. And they're having a conversation that's driven perhaps more by insurance or by their own personal opinion about what should be the likely best procedure. Um, and it's not a, a clear balanced. I mean, at any time you have that kind of variation in care across different clinical practices, it's probably not informed patient choice that's driving that variation in care. There's some other factor that's involved. And I think what would be likely to happen is you're going to have heterogeneity in outcomes there too, because you've got some patients being poorly matched with the procedure. If they'd had a different option available to them, if they had a different set of information presented to them in an unbiased way, comparing the different procedures, they might have made a very different choice than, than the, uh, the one that they are, they're under. Um, I wanted to comment also just briefly about this idea of the, uh, the, uh, the AHRQ data and being able to represent uh, what's uh, relevant, this sort of the, the review that was reviewed today. And I think one other area to focus is we've done several studies in the VA population. And I think the VA cohort, um, there's a national representative cohort where we've done some analysis related to the long-term survival and shown similar to the Swedish obese subject study that bariatric surgery in, compared to non-surgical treatment improves longevity, reduces mortality, um, and then we also have shown durability of weight loss in to 10 years in bariatric surgic, surgical subjects, mostly focused on the gastric bypass population. Um, but I think the VA population represents a very similar to the disabled and older population that you're considering here, and those are long-term outcome studies with uh, very good follow-up in the VA population that I, I think represent sort of some of the evidence base that we're trying to circle, circle on today. Okay. This will be the last comment because I want to give Dr. Ollendorf a chance to ask questions in the rest of the panel. I'll try to make it quick, but I have another perspective on why you can see a really heavy influence of one procedure in a region and a different in a different region. So I'm in Iowa, and when I came to that community, there was a lot of bias against gastric bypass. There had been several bad outcomes many years ago. It was in the paper, lots of lawsuits, toxic environment. Nobody in that community wanted a bypass. I don't care what you tell them. So we do a lot of sleeve gastrectomies. Now, obesity is like an epidemiologic disease. <coughs> obese people have obese friends. They have obese family. Those are our number one source of patients. It's not referral from their primary care doctors. So I have a patient who does great with a sleeve. They tell their sister. They tell their friend at work. They come and they want a sleeve. Doesn't matter if I tell them, I really think you'd do better with a gastric bypass. They say, nope, my sister had a sleeve. That's what I want. And we still give them an informed discussion. But I would argue that there is a lot of patient-driven um, aspect to that community-based preference in procedures. People in a different community don't have that same external bias of this history. So I, I think there's some other things other than just the surgeon told them what to do. I think there is opportunity for informed choice but still have a community feeling. Good. That's a helpful perspective. Thank you. And, and speakers, just let me remind you to please identify yourself at, at the mic. Oh, that's okay. Can you say your name, please? Yes. For the record. Teresa Lamasters, and I'm a bariatric surgeon in Iowa. Thanks. We got the Iowa part. <laughs> uh, so Dan Ollendorf with the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. Um, I've got several <laughs> questions, so I may ask them all now, and then the, the various respondents can jump up and, and respond. Um, so the first one is actually for Ms. Fulton. Um, so with the observational data we've seen showing the rise in sleep gastrectomy, I'm wondering if you have any information on how the local coverage determinations have distributed among the contractors um, that you can share with us. Um, and before you answer, let me throw my other questions out there. Um, for Dr. Di Maria or any of the, the other surgeons, we heard a lot in the studies that focused on diabetes remission or improvement in glycemic control about those measures. We didn't hear so much about relapse of glycemic control. And I know that at least in some of these large trials, that was a pretty sizable number, and it'd be great if you could comment on why you think that is. Um, and then finally, for Dr. Arterburn, sorry to make you get up again, um, 
I'm familiar enough with the PCORnet infrastructure to not be surprised and, and still be impressed by your great retention numbers um, out to five years. What I'm wondering is if there's any way that you've found to capture whether patients are actually still enrolled in their post-surgical monitoring and follow-up programs as a potential effect modifier. So those are my three. Sarah Fulton, CMS. Um, I don't have details about the MAC um, policies right here in front of me, so I don't think I could intelligently comment on that right now. Okay. Um, sorry. Dan Leslie, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. Um, so I'll comment about recidivism. Um, you know, I think uh, you know, we did a randomized study, a diabetes surgery study, 60 patients randomized to undergo gastric bypass with uh, best medical management versus just um, best medical management uh, alone. And um, so if we, if we looked at the outcomes as a composite of A1C control under 7%, LDL under 100, and systolic blood pressure under 130, which was the definition several years back for diabetes control. 49% in the gastric bypass group, 19% in the lifestyle alone group, and they both received equal lifestyle and medical management, uh, achieved control of that composite endpoint. But we know that the patients in that study, we had to screen 1,900 patients to get 120 willing to undergo randomization in two different countries, four different centers. Um, and the diabetes was challenging. I mean, it was A1C above 8% to begin with. And so that, and that was the equipoise that our endocrinologists allowed us to use to offer a gastric bypass in addition to lifestyle. Um, we now have five-year data that has been accepted, not published, and the composite endpoint is closer to the, in the 20s range for the gastric bypass, but in the single digits for um, the lifestyle alone group. The Swedish obesity subjects study um, showed a similar diabetes uh, recidivism rate, around 67% out in the 10-year time frame from an initial. Diabetes is progressive. Beta cell dysfunction is progressive. You can't assume that uh, the pancreas is secreting equal amounts of insulin at the time of surgery as it will be five, 10 years down the road. So anytime we've looked at um, diabetes control and, and remission, uh, there's generally going to be recidivism going down the road past the one-year point. Food intake reduction, uh, weight loss will control A1C very well the first six to 12 months. But the, the, the amount of control is pretty incredible compared to uh, no surgery. You could ascribe a lot of that to the weight loss and the dose effect of additional amounts of weight loss <coughs> above 10% weight loss that some of the bariatric procedures offer. Hi, uh, Christopher Still from Geisinger. Uh, we do have some uh, information on relapse. Uh, so these individuals, and I just checked this, asked this question yesterday, so it's very timely. We looked at relapse after diabetes remission, and the definition of diabetes remission was one year without elevated labs or medication. So a six point uh, hemoglobin A1C under 6.5 for one year. Um, and found the rate about 25% at four years after remission. So 25% uh, at four years after remission. The rate was higher in pre-op insulin losers, uh, users and lower in non-insulin losers users and higher in those with late remission and a little lower in those with remission occurring immediately after surgery. So. David Arterburn from Kaiser Permanente Washington. I'll actually touch on the relapse thing first because we've done a fair bit of work on that as well. We showed in the Kaiser, per, the Kaiser population that 35% uh, of patients redevelop diabetes within five years after uh, their initial remission, but we also went on to study the microvascular outcomes of that patient population and look at patients who uh, had remitted and then subsequently relapsed 
and looked at their health outcomes compared to patients who had not ever remitted their diabetes and found that even patients who remitted and then subsequently relapsed had a lower risk of incident microvascular disease complications than patients who had never achieved a diabetes remission. For each year of time they spent in remission, uh, they had a 19% relative risk reduction in their risk of incident microvascular disease. Um, in that population, we know that the predictors of who's going to relapse are people uh, who have early, later stage diabetes, so more uh, longer duration diabetes, if they're on insulin, if they have poor hemoglobin A1C control at the time of surgery, it suggests that patients with earlier stage diabetes are actually likely to do better, have longer duration remission and less microvascular disease outcomes. And, but even those patients who do have a short period of remission, even as short as uh, one and a half to two years, seem to be sort of the threshold within our study of when the, the, it became statistically significant within our cohort, those patients had lower microvascular disease risk than, than the patients who didn't go in remission. On the post-surgical monitoring piece in the PCORNET study, it's not something we've looked at currently. We have the ability to look at individual encounters and go back and see if the patients were seeing the bariatric surgeon, how much of that follow-up time was with the bariatric surgeon. But I think a big advantage of the PCORNET use of electronic health records is that we're capturing all weight measures and all outcomes captured in the entire healthcare system. So I think one advantage is that there are many patients don't follow up, and, but they do follow up with someone else. They see another specialist or primary care provider that does manage those conditions, and we can get some information about it. But we can also address a, p a piece of your question um, to the extent that it's coded. Sure. Marcel Saliba, I have several questions. Um, I want to bring them about first just commenting on the TA that there was, I guess, you know, trials are being done on bariatric procedures. However, none met the criteria for the TA, meaning that they did not have. Um, either the time period or a mean age of 55, or, I guess. Uh, and I believe this is because, and so this gives us evidence that's not really applicable to the Medicare older population, which, as was also pointed out by the TA, has like about 6 million uh, people with a BMI over 35. So that's a lot of people without any applicable evidence. Um, so why is that? Um, the, it seems, I, I looked at some of the trials being done of new products and some of the endoscopic trials um, have uh, numerous exclusions in them and, uh, you know, for, for a variety of comorbidities, but a lot of them have a very um, set upper end point, upper age limit of, you have to be under 65 to be in those trials. And so why is that? And the, um, the real upshot of that is to go to Dr. Sullivan's slide on, which was, I thought, very counterintuitive, that the trial data for these endoscopic procedures showed, you know, not that impressive results, and she showed more impressive or what she called higher effectiveness in clinical practice once the products were out on the market using, I guess, this post-marketing surveillance data. And so is that an artifact from all this um, exclusionary work? And why then should we exclude people over age 65 from these trials? Because they need to know uh, the results, you know, that might be applicable to them. Uh. Orestes Panagiotou from uh, Brown University again. Um, that's an excellent question and something that uh, we have performed research over the years on uh, in this area about generalizability and accessibility of uh, subgroups and different uh, <coughs> populations. Uh, I cannot speak about why these people are excluded from trials because I'm not a trialist myself. Um, so it's something that I cannot address. If I were to design a trial, I may have set up different criteria, but this is not my... Uh, my role. Um, and because we knew for empirical evidence uh, funded, uh, there are projects funded by NIH, by, NI, um, 
by ARC that empirically look at registries and databases and publish literature to try to see who is in different trials for different uh, conditions, not only bariatric surgery. So there is enormous uh, literature that shows that most people over 65 are not represented in clinical trials. That was the main reason that we lowered a little bit our threshold and we went to 55 so that we can have a population that resembles the age criterion for Medicare as close as uh, possible. Then uh, this also relates to how we interpret evidence that exists that is available or how clinicians uh, apply evidence that is available in elderly, in younger patients when they treat uh, uh, older people. And of course, the evidence-based framework is not that we should only rely on the diamond effect estimate of a meta-analysis, but how are we taking this meta-analysis and combine with what is available, uh, what, with what we see in clinical practice. So actually, it's the intersection, the Venn diagram of both quantitative uh, and methodological evidence and clinical evidence. So that is about why uh, some of these patients in these trials are not eligible for our systematic review. Uh, it doesn't mean that if an observational study is available, it is necessarily lower quality of evidence or lower strength of evidence compared to randomized trials. Uh, but when we analyzed the, or the sample of observational studies that we had, uh, we didn't only check a criterion or checkbox that said observational versus randomized. We looked how these randomized trials, these observational studies were analyzed and designed. Uh, some of these trials, uh, sorry, some of these studies have very minimum balance for, uh, minimum adjustment for confounders. So I have a study in front of me that only adjusts for uh, sex, BMI, age, when they match, and then uh, a year of bariatric surgery and BMI at baseline. These are the adjusters, the adjustments in their models. So uh, given that there may be lots of unmeasured confounders in these populations, we felt that if a randomized trial is, sorry, an observational study is analyzed in an extent that doesn't really capture the unmeasured confounder, this cannot be the same as a randomized trial that is designed and analyzed, as again, an observational study that is analyzed and randomized, and analy designed and analyzed um, like a randomized trials. Uh, there is also the concept of uh, most people when they uh, approach observational studies, they focus on confounders, but there are also issues that relate to how the T0, when the observation or the, you know, the intervention is starting being measured, is uh, addressed. And none of the studies that we found uh, actually described how this T0 related bias or something that can be expressed as immortal time bias is uh, addressed. Uh, we found very few studies that went beyond uh, regression models, which are models that if you put too many variables in, you're going, they're going to give you a wide confidence interval. So very few studies used methods like propensity scores or inverse probability treatment weights that could give you a more accurate uh, estimate <coughs> of the treatment effect. Again, these studies may have limitations or these methods may have limitations that relate to what variables you put into your models. So as long as you put four variables compared to a random uh, observational study that puts 50 or 100 covariates, again, these results are probably very different and we interpret the, the strength of evidence accordingly. Was there another point that I missed? Oh, in the interest of Thank time, we're going to have to keep going. Thank right. you. Hi, I'm Dr. Shelby Sullivan from University of Colorado School of Medicine, representing the ASG and ABE. Um, so, the, so the first question about um, why there is an increase in weight loss seen in clinical effectiveness or the clinical um, case series that we see compared with the, the randomized trials and, and really even in particular the randomized sham control trials as well. So what we see pretty consistently at this point is that there is a significant effect of sham on uh, weight loss devices um, in, these, in these studies and it's actually across different devices um, and is pretty consistently 30 to 40 percent reduction in weight loss that we see in sham trials. So even though uh, in, in particular we have one study um, that we published recently on the POSE procedure where we had patients who had a run-in procedure, so knew that they had the procedure, and then followed up with patients who were then randomized to either active or control, but again, they didn't know which group they were in. The group that was in the, in the unblinded run-in group had 40% more weight loss than the active sham, the active group that was randomized and didn't know they had the procedure, even though they had otherwise exactly the same follow-up follow plan 
um, and essentially treatment. The only difference was the sham, the effective sham. We also have, we, we think is in effect of having less individual therapy um, for these patients. So whereas in clinical practice, if a patient is not doing quite as well or if there's other issues that are going on, um, the practitioners will actually do more individual care with those patients. In the trials, we are very specific, and I've actually been involved in development of a lot of the lifestyle therapy protocols for these um, studies. They are very specific in what the, um, what the study team is actually able to do and how much time they're able to spend with patients. So it's equal across all study subjects. And of course, the people who are giving that therapy don't know what group the patients are in. Um, but it has to be very specific and very um, uh, in terms of what they're actually delivering. So we think that that overall does reduce weight loss that we see both in the active arm and in the control arm as well. Um, there, uh, in terms of the other question that you had about patients not being enrolled who are over the age of 65, um, the best thing I can say about this is that um, in general, when we're doing study design, we're trying to find a homogeneous population in order to do these studies on so that we have really similar patients in both the active arms and the control arms. Um, and I think that just in general, there um, has been in the past in particular some biases into thinking that patients who have who are older than 65, that obesity might not be as much of a problem with those patients. Now, we understand that that is not the case at this point and that weight loss is really beneficial in these, in these patients. But when we're designing these trials, um, that is, uh, again, to, to come up with a, a, a homogeneous population, uh, patients older than 65 have not been included in these trials. It would be great to actually do studies on these patients, but even at this point, um, going back and doing studies on the patients that are older than 65, doing randomized controlled studies, is um, most likely going to be cost prohibitive. I'm going to ask the responders to be as terse and as concise as possible in responding to, to the question because we have okay. eight more panelists who want to ask questions. Okay. Could Thank I you. just do a little follow-up for something she said? Go ahead. Just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You said that um, there was a 30% uh, weight loss in the sham group. I thought you said. No. When you compare active, compare it's when somebody knows they have a procedure versus whether they don't know where they have the procedure, where they really that we've done a very good right. sham and those patients don't know that they have had the procedure, whether or not they have had it, that, um, that there is essentially a reduction of about 30% um, or an increase of 40% of weight loss. So in the trial that I'm specifically talking about, there was 5% weight loss in the group that was in the randomized portion of it. Okay. Um, they had low intensity lifestyle therapy. That's another point that's important to know is that the intensity of lifestyle therapy also definitely affects total amount of weight loss. But in the patients that knew they had the procedure, despite the fact that they had the same exact treatment, had 7% total body weight loss. Okay. The Thank only you. difference was not, was knowing that they had the procedure. So if they didn't, if they were randomized and they didn't know it was 5%, but yeah. if they, the same thing, but they knew it. No, it was 7%. If they knew that they had it, 7%. And that's the only difference. Thank you. Brief comment. The best way to get information for people over Can 65. Can you state your name, please? Sure. Sorry. Matt Hutter from the Mass General Hospital. The best way for us to get information on people over 65 is by have coverage with evidence or coverage with accreditation. If there's coverage and they're getting the procedures, we're capturing it. We're capturing it with the MBSA QIP data collection program so we can get that data for you. And I think that, that's, that will be important. Okay. Renee Williams, New York University School of Medicine. Um, I want to thank everyone for their presentations. Something I would have liked to have heard more about would be um, potential healthcare disparities within this population. Renee, can uh, you speak a little closer to the microphone, please? Uh, is this good? Yes, yeah. good. I said I would have liked to have hear, heard more about the healthcare disparities. I thought there was a gap in the presentations there, otherwise extremely comprehensive and informative. Um, I have one, or actually two questions for Dr. Sullivan um, in regards to the intragastric balloons. Number one, you mentioned the serious adverse events, um, that most of these were dehydration from nausea and vomiting. Could you comment on any other potential serious adverse events that you saw? Well, um, example, were there any obstructions that were noticed in the trials you mentioned? And um, number two, it's also been commented that these balloons, while they're indicated right now in BMIs of 30 to 40, that they could potentially be a bridge to surgery. Um, is there any information on using it in that context? 
Absolutely. Uh, again, Shelby Sullivan, University of Colorado School of Medicine, representing ASGE and ABE. So to your first question about um, the balloons and their serious adverse event rates. So about 75% of the serious adverse event rates that occurred in the um, trials were related to um, nausea, vomiting, um, and abdominal pain that required IV fluids. Um, so those were serious adverse events because the patients had to come into the hospital, get um, an IV placed, and have hydration. Um, we have sub subsequently become much better at actually treating those and actually preventing these symptoms with newer medications. But at the time when we did these trials, we just didn't have that kind of experience. The other serious adverse events that occurred during the trials were mostly related to either gastric perforation, pneumonia, or um, perforation of the esophagus. Um, these were very low in their um, rates of incidence and were similar to what we've seen in the clinical experience outside of the U.S. as well. Um, there have been a couple of things that have come up since then that were not that did not occur in the trials, and I'm sure many of you have heard about the, um, the FDA release of, of information about deaths that occurred. These deaths, um, first of all, when we look at the rate of deaths, so the ASGE published a meta-analysis in 2015 of the intragastric balloons, and we found out of all of our patients that, um, that were looked at in this, in this cohort that there was a 0.08% um, risk of death, and those were primarily related to gastric uh, uh, perforation that were in patients who had previous foregut surgery, and um, aspiration pneumonia that occurred with device removal. We know that these balloons cause some delay in gastric emptying, and if the patients are having these balloons removed and have a lot of food sitting in their stomach, that there can be the risk of that aspiration. Um, so we, we lose this as, um, as teachable moments. Um, right now, in my practice, we actually have uh, changed our practice in such that we only remove balloons with general anesthesia so we can pre protect the airway, and we would never put a balloon in somebody who has a history of prior foregut surgery. There have been deaths that have occurred, again, that, were, that the FDA um, recently reported. However, as the FDA um, very appropriately also reported with this, is that we cannot actually directly attribute those deaths um, to the balloons themselves. Those are either deaths that occurred in patients who had the balloons in place, but we can't necessarily attribute these deaths to the balloons themselves. You have to remember that we also talk about balloons as being used in patients um, not only for bridge therapy for bariatric surgery or for, um, for knee replacement, for example, but also potentially for patients who need other organ transplants. And so those are sick patients. And so there may be instances where deaths occur that aren't actually necessarily related to the balloons themselves, but related to the sickness of the patient. The other thing to remember as well is that of the deaths that are reported, when we take the information that the sponsors have actually given to us in terms of the numbers of patients who have been treated, this rate is still less than 0.01%. So that's important to keep in mind, that it's uh, in general still a very safe procedure, and really the safety is similar to what we see for endosco general endoscopic procedures. Um, does that I'm answer have, all of your questions? Yeah, okay. It does. Dr. Yates, so, do you have another question? Okay. You have another one? Um, just one more quick question, I, and I don't know if there's an answer to this. I think um, earlier, it's a Dr. Sudan had mentioned that um, in African Americans, there's a worse resolution of comorbidities. Do we have any thoughts as to why that is? Thank you, and uh, first of all, uh, I sincerely appreciate uh, you mentioning that we were remiss in uh, not talking much about disparities. In the same disparity study that we did, I want to highlight uh, African-American men in particular, uh, I think, suffer disproportionately higher amounts of uh, hypertension, diabetes compared. And these, uh, this particular group was actually seeking less bariatric operation for whatever reason, or was underrepresented when you looked at the prevalence of obesity uh, hypertension and diabetes in, in other populations compared to the folks who were seeking bariatric surgery. Why exactly that happens, we, th we did not look into the mechanisms of that. Uh, but it does point out to the fact that this particular population group does need better education and perhaps more outreach than what we are currently providing them. John Scott, Greenville, South Carolina, and Access to Care representative for the ASMBS. And speaking in terms of healthcare disparities, uh, the, the thing you have to know with the general population, the insurance covered patients, and even uh, the LCDs is that there are barriers to getting surgical care. And for people that have, um, that are in lower sec socioeconomic statuses, um, the hoops that people have to jump through to obtain uh, surgical services, it's difficult uh, for a lot of people, and, and often people will turn away from seeking surgical care 
because they don't have transportation means, they don't have the financial means uh, to go to recurrent uh, uh, doctor's appointments uh, to purchase, uh, get on diet programs prior to surgery, which uh, some insurance carriers provide. And so there are barriers to care um, that prevent people from obtaining surgical services. Okay. Um, we only have 15, 16 minutes left in the session, so I'm going to ask the panelists if you have a question that you feel compelled to ask, hold up a card. And we'll go. So yeah. let's get started. Well, I'm sorry I did to cut you short, but we, gotta, we have to keep quick moving. Quick comment. So, Sai Pichamun Jiu from Brigham and Women's Hospital. So, I have a brief comment on the bridge therapy for endoscopic bariatric therapy. So, we do have some successful story for people who are too big and too sick to get surgery. And we placed a balloon, and the patients were able to lose weight, and his BMI came down. So, he had heart failure. So, he was too sick to get a cardiac transplant. We placed a balloon, and his BMI came down to 38. And now he underwent successful cardiac. Can you speak into the mic? We oh, sorry. I can't hear you. Um, Okay, so the patient was too sick, he's big, he had end-stage heart failure, so we do place a balloon and the patient successful, successfully lost weight and then he was able to undergo a cardiac transplant and now his heart failure symptoms are much okay. better. Dr. Yates? Yeah, I have three questions that should have succinct answers okay. and it has to do with, de with defining the Medicare population we're talking about. <clears throat> Dr. Yates from uh, UPMC. I have a question for Dr. Penninger too and Dr. Tricolanos. Thank you. Fo with a follow-up that's gonna be similar for Dr. Leslie and then a question for Dr. DeMaria. And the question I have for Dr. Penninger too and Dr. Tricolanos is, in the papers you studied, in those patients that were Medicare eligible by age, did you age stratify or look at the distribution of ages to be able to see when there's an extinction of the procedure occurring or where there is very rare occurrence of the procedure, given the fact that people with morbid and super obesity have shortened lives for the most part. Um, at what age stratification did you see it didn't occur anymore? Age 70 to 75, 75 to 80, where did it stop? Uh, so there were some studies that uh, provided the results, sub, uh, subgroup results by different age groups. Uh, sorry, or, uh, my name is Orestes Panagiotou from uh, Brown University. So I was, I was saying, um, there were some studies that stratified the 55 plus age, uh, age population into different subgroups. Uh, most of them uh, were stopping up to 75 years old, uh, from, where I, uh, from what I remember. Um, so about but, 75 you stop? Uh, that what the, the stats that we saw, uh, the, the maximum was about 75 years of age. Okay. Then the follow-up questions for Dr. Leslie and the information that you presented, and thank you for presenting the how significant the disabled population is in the overall Medicare distribution. In that population, it's a raised stratification to see whether it just doesn't happen anymore at a certain age. Dan Leslie, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. Uh, so uh, we, we didn't do a full stratification. Uh, we just know that a third is in the age 65 and older and about two thirds uh, in the disabled, which would be under 65. Um, a very small fraction was end-stage renal disease, about 100 right. cases per year. Um, I think it's probably more going to be anecdotal, and you can ask everybody the oldest patient they've operated on, and it may be 76 for me. I've heard a little older than that, and it's always going to be physiologic uh, age, and, um, and that's generally how, how we would do things. If they can you know, walk into clinic and are very vibrant, uh, they may still have surgery at an older age. And then question for Dr. Maria as representative of the metabolic and bariatric surgery group. Um, since you threw the gauntlet down, I do have to say one thing that is not on the record for this meeting, but there is evidence that total joint replacement does extend uh, life. And I can share the papers with you. Uh, they're population based as well as uh, deep, deep data mining. So we'll, we'll share papers later. That'd, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. But just collegial, collegial <laughs> comment there. Uh, at any and rate. I didn't mean to malign the orthopedic surgeons of the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's all right. Sure. I didn't come up and have a fight with you. Uh, but my question for you is, is that it has come up that, um, that there are exclusions for some of the RCTs and that there are barriers to RCTs because of exclusion. In your society's opinion, when you guys sit down and talk about this, what is a fair exclusion criteria for upper age? And what would you think is a real outlier by age? I mean, are we really talking about 65 to 90 in a Medicare population? Or are we really talking 65 to 75? 
And Eric DiMaria from Richmond, Virginia. So um, I, I'm reminded of Dave Flum's series uh, back in the early 2000s looking at mortality in Medicare, and he had age brackets that went up to 90. And all of us looked at that data and said, we're probably not talking about bariatric surgery in this data set. Um, I'm, I'm an old bariatric surgeon, which translates into experienced. And uh, I haven't operated on a patient for a primary operation over the age of 75. And I think if we polled the bariatric surgeons here, we'd probably be in about that ballpark, mid-70s, maybe a little bit more. So, so we shouldn't really be talking about people 90 years old, in Thank my you. opinion. I'm going to ask the panelists, the rest, to limit yourself to one question, please, so we can finish by two. Is there any way I can Sorry, add? Can, can I just add one point to that? This is Shelby Sullivan, University of, University of Colorado. There was a slide that I had that unfortunately I couldn't show, but there was a study that was published in 2016 based off of um, annualized Medicare expenditures from uh, and 1998 number. to 2008 that showed twice as much cost in the age 60, 65 to 69 in the BMI 35 and above compared to everybody else group. And that was, the trend was similar for age 70 to 74, but not in the 75 and above. Okay, Dr. Zuckerman. I have more yeah. than one, but well, quick questions. We, we questions. have to finish by two o'clock, so I want to give everybody a chance to at least ask their own Yeah, well, I'd like my chance. Um, this is uh, for the, um, the men from Brown. Um, to follow up on the publication bias issue, I looked at some of the studies um, and I was really surprised that there were preliminary data. So a study might be uh, purported to be a five-year study or even a two-year study, but half the people were gone after 18 months and sometimes more than half the people were gone. Uh, and yet there was no, even though those studies were sometimes published several years ago, there's no other study of that same group. And so both in terms of the publication bias of what a journal will publish, but also what the authors will try to publish, and particularly when they have a conflict of interest of some sort. So I wondered if there was any data at all on loss to follow up and how those people might be different and why they're, they've disappeared after such a short period of time. Um, and also in the studies that were done on um, deaths, I'm assuming that they did look at all death certificates, whether people were still in a study or not, but for, you didn't yeah. look at deaths, so. Uh, Ores Ispanagiotu from Brown University. Um, yes, we, when we identified publications from the same study, uh, like uh, one example uh, would be the SOS, the uh, Swedish Observational Study or OBIS Study. Um, we looked at uh, how the results look at the, at the longest follow-up, and we used the one that would give us uh, the larger sample size and so that we could have enough number of events to have a powerful uh, determination of how the effect would look like. Uh, of course, what you're saying about attrition over follow-up is a very big concern, and we saw one graph where we had multiple time points for mini gastric bypass, and we saw that at five years, only 45% of the people were followed. So this raises the issue, how representative are people who go back or do not go back? It might be that they are doing better, so they prefer to go back to their physician, or it's likely that they're doing worse, they're, uh, uh, they decide to give up and they don't follow up with observation, with uh, appointments, so we don't know how these people look in terms of weight loss. Of course, this is an attrition by, or um, this type of attrition is some, definitely something that uh, is, we have taken into account when we temper the data. Uh, but we, given that we work with published data, we cannot really try to correct for that and try to say what the effect would look like if everybody was being followed up. I'm it, sorry, it, I just didn't understand the last sentence that you just said. Say it a little more slowly, please. So we have people who do not, uh, not 100% not, not, not of the people who have the intervention come back at five years or at every six month appointments. Mm -hmm. And we saw, we have this graph where we saw how many gastric bypass performs in terms of weight loss. Mm -hmm. And we see that it plateaus uh, after, I believe the first year, if I remember correctly. But 95% of the people who got the intervention came back at uh, uh, one year and only about 45% came back at the longest follow up, which was five, uh, five years later. So we do not know what are the differences between the people who come back 
and we have the data at different time points, and those who do not come back. Right. We're going to move on to the next question, and if you guys want to continue the conversations, you can do that at a, at a later point in time, but I want everybody to have an opportunity to ask, ask a question. So, Dr. Hilker, is there next. Uh, this is uh, Bob Hilker, the industry representative from Novartis Pharmaceutical. Uh, my question is actually to anyone who feels they could answer it. Um, I'm interested in finding more about the respiratory outcomes, and I think it's, you know, we're being asked to kind of um, evaluate the quality of the evidence, and uh, what I've heard so far and from some of the readings, um, I understand that there's some data on obstructive sleep apnea, but I haven't heard anything about any other respiratory outcomes. Specifically, is there you know, less pneumonia after people have surgery? Is there less restrictive lung disease? You know, um, you know, what really happens to these patients from a pulmonary and you know, respiratory uh, point of view? Um, can anyone comment on that? Uh, Teresa LaMasters, a bariatric surgeon from Iowa. And um, my quick comment is, I don't have the data off the top of my head, but what we do have is a lot of data regarding decreased inflammatory response all over the body with bariatric surgery. So we actually see a rapid improvement in asthma and restrictive lung diseases. And also doing these, these procedures laparoscopically, which is 98% of the technique that we use, has a much um, allowed us to do these procedures on much higher risk pulmonary patients because there's less pulmonary impact. So I'm sorry I don't have the data right off the top of my head. Yeah, Eric DeMaria again from Richmond. And I don't necessarily have exactly the information you're seeking at the tip of my tongue either, but I did want to say I was very surprised to see the gentleman from Brown suggest that obstructive sleep apnea relapses after successful weight loss surgery. That is not our clinical impression. However, getting patients back to have follow-up sleep investigations is very challenging. Health insurance won't pay for the normal study a year later, uh, so it's a big challenge to actually document, but what I can tell you is that our patients stop using their appliances. They stop using their machines. They presented originally with symptomatic sleep apnea, that's how we pick them up, and their symptoms go away. The other comment that I thought of when you talked about pneumonia specifically is uh, the effectiveness of gastric bypass in particular for gastroesophageal reflux, which can lead to pneumonia through aspiration. It's probably the most effective operation that we have for gastroesophageal reflux disease, so that may relate to the pneumonia issue. Dr. Betts? No, no, we'll, I, we'll skip to the clock. Dr. Betts, please. You can, you can have these conversations after. <laughs> Martha Betts, FDA. Uh, my question is regards to the applicability Speaking of... Speak the mic, please. Excuse me? Okay. Martha Betts, FDA. Um, my question is in regards to the data that is collected in studies that were conducted outside the U.S. and the applicability to the U.S. population. I saw in Dr. De Maria's presentation and the presentation for the technology assessment that the data was presented together without any discussion about differences in patient population or standard of care that may cause us to expect a different benefit here in the U.S. So if somebody could speak to that, that would be helpful. So, gee, I guess I will. Hi, uh, Eric De Maria again. So, um, <laughs> You know, obviously we're trying to provide you with the best long-term, high-quality information that we have around the world. I, I would say um, the world is now a small place. We interact constantly with people internationally. Uh, it's not like procedures are done in a completely different way overseas today uh, in our world. The SUS, SOS study is probably the most significant overseas study that we have, and, and it... Um, it's the best long-term data in the world, so that, that's why we use that data. But we do have other studies in the U.S. that show exactly the same kind of benefits and, uh, and so forth. So that's, that's why we include them. Dr. Klein? Two minutes, come on. <laughs> Dr. Klein, you can have to have the conversation afterwards. Uh, or is from Brown. Uh, I would like to, maybe I should, we should have emphasized that in the report that we don't generate the data that we analyze. We work with published data and with whatever is reported in the literature. Uh, reporting is not ideal. You try to write a 3,004 uh, word uh, paper when you have spent two years analyzing data and you have so much information. 
uh, when it comes to comparing these, uh, the, the different populations across uh, countries or across different settings, uh, although there is empirical evidence that sometimes effect size is made different across different uh, 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 countries because of access to healthcare infrastructure and all the uh, reasons that you mentioned, uh, we were not, it was not our task to try to say how, people, how end users of our systematic report or systematic review should utilize this evidence. We present it, we have appendices where we say where the study comes from. Perhaps we can include some of this information uh, more clearly. Uh, You're but, using up everybody else's time. You okay, can have sorry. these conversations afterward, please. Sam Klein, Wash U, St. Louis. I uh, appreciate the enthusiasm of the uh, speakers. Um, this is actually a, a little bit of a stretch of this uh, um, l previous question because this regards laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding in which the data are very different in Australia than potentially in the U.S. where the results seem to be much more promising. So I wanted to address this regarding U.S. data and maybe to narrow it to um, Dr. Warscheib uh, or Dr. DiMaria or Dr. Arterburn because you know everything there is to know, uh, David. But. Um, the question, there was a, a data shown that reoperation is very common after laparoscopic gastric banding, and which is potentially a serious problem despite the safety and even though it's more modest efficacy. So my question is, what is a reoperation for? And how many, reop, what percent reoperation is there for actually removing the band because of a problem or to have another operation to expand, uh, increase weight loss? I think I know the paper you're referencing. It was in Dr. Can you state your name, please? Uh, Dr. Sid Rorschach from Illinois. Um, the uh, data that you reference uh, was not really clinical data. It was, it was uh, a tabulation of payment. And what was described in um, that report really has not uh, been demonstrated in anything clinically. And there is a question whether some of the coding that was used to, to um, uh, come up with the results um, that were reported um, created a flaw in some of that. Um, the first thing to know about gastric banding is um, the reoperations are uh, of minimal morbidity. Um, there is definitely um, an overpayment for some of these reoperations by CMS because they're required to be in an inpatient setting. Just to get to the meat, what percent reoperation, if you know, is there because of a complication or a problem where the band is removed, and what percent of reoperation is there to increase the weight loss because the initial weight loss was felt to be inadequate? That's, good. That's really the question. Right now, there's definitely a trend in those patients who have. I like to say lost efficacy from their band after many years to be converted to sleeve gastrectomy. That seems to be the uh, most um, popular, if I can use that word, conversion. And it simply trends what is now the most popular procedure. Um, I do not know the percentage of uh, revision to or conversion to sleeve, but it is very practice specific. It's very um, geographically dictated, and I think what we've learned over the last uh, 10 years and what uh, some of what I highlighted is banding is, has a requirement to be done in a very dedicated center that does primarily banding. Okay. And when somebody does primarily banding, they're going to have reoperation rates of 5 to 7 percent, and uh, zero mortality and, and nothing of great morbidity. Dr. Tellum and Dr. Wolf, you're going to have to accept my apology. My taskmasters are telling me we have to stay on schedule. So we're going to move to the next phase of the program. And then if you have questions, I would please ask you to direct them to the appropriate persons afterwards. You ready? Mm -hmm. It's now time for the open panel discussion. Mm -hmm. It's the open panel discussion. All right, so what do we? What are we doing here? Hmm? This is part of the open panel. I'll, I'll be brief, but maybe we'll start down the other end. Yeah, uh, but I, I think from the presentations uh, and, and what Doug alluded to previously, there are a lot of unanswered questions. Um, the, the field of bariatric surgery has progressed dramatically 
from the, 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 the Scandinavian study, which is 2007 in the New England Journal, uh, to 10 years later, where it's encouraging that we are having these conversations and reason, raising the questions that, that need, need to be asked. I found it fairly interesting. I hear a lot about obstructive sleep apnea and nothing about obesity hypoventilation syndrome from, from Charles Dickens and the Pickwick Papers. Um, so I, th those are just areas that we don't know what the benefit or outcome is, 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 is going to be. So let me start, Dr. Wolf, you can start and we'll work our way back up in terms of, of your comments about the presentations. Uh, and any time uh, an evidence base is accumulated uh, on a literature search, the criteria for the search are critical. Um, and uh, it's concerning to me when we hear that there was no evidence uh, regarding the effect of uh, bariatric surgery on diabetes. Um, we've, uh, it's been discussed about the age criterion and whether that uh, was appropriately applied or was not. Um, it may be that uh, age was not a, a good criterion to have in the search at all, uh, but rather burden of disease since we have also heard that the disease burden among the uh, Medicare disabled is greater than uh, it is among the over 65. Uh, but uh, I, I can't say that you would have found paper specific uh, to the Medicare disabled with a greater disease burden. Uh, had that been a criterion as well. But uh, I, I think you addressed the question about four times uh, regarding the uh, use of age as a criterion. And I don't know that there's much more we can say other than it's a limitation of uh, the uh, literature body that you were presented with. Dr. Tellum. Thank you. And I want to thank all the speakers for their compelling talks and clearly the amount of time that was put into making them. Um, I shared some of the same input, uh, concerns about the input to the ARC study in terms of the age criteria and whether including that was representative, understanding that the median age of Medicare patients is 46 and some of the RCTs that were excluded have mean ages of 49 with a standard deviation of 8, so figuring out where to do that cutoff might be a little bit arbitrary. Uh, to say the data are not generalizable also concerned me a little bit. Uh, Dr. DiMaria had one slide up that did show comparable outcomes, at least in the perioperative period for patients over 65 as compared to the uh, rest of the MBSA equip data. More long-term data would be great. I know that's in the works. I wish it was available today, and I know that everybody's doing a stellar job trying to correct that. One thing we did hear a lot about today are access issues. Uh, namely in getting to surgery and long-term follow-up, which may be a barrier. There looks to be a fair amount of qualitative or at least survey work that's looking into maybe some of the barriers that are going on, but I think a cleaner definition of trying to figure out how much of that is attributable to patient, provider, and societal bias or versus coverage decisions would be important in moving uh, forward. But that's um, pretty much what I'd say. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I see nothing wrong uh, with the study you did as long as it's understood what the criteria were for, you know, the enrollment of the, of the paper, so it's valuable information. Um, what I do see is that there's very little, there is no real gold standard data of randomized control trials in Medicare populations, and there never will be. So you have to use your best judgment for what the data are in other populations, and, and there will be more data in the future by going back into uh, looking at you know, results from uh, databases. And so I think you have to just use common sense and not uh, simply exclude the ability of providing a, a beneficial therapy for a group of patients because there's no randomized control trials. Yeah, I echo the previous comments that um, there didn't seem to be clear data presented on the Medicare population today. We did talk about generalizability of some of the data um, and that there were some similar outcomes, but no clear studies in that population. But as we mentioned, they may not exist. So when I, um, when I look at the data, first of all, I guess I'm struck by the fact that obviously this type of surgery and treatment is very different from other fields. And um, one of the comments that the patient advocate commented that really struck with me was when he said, you know, that we would never um, tell a cancer patient they could only have, you know, one procedure for the rest of their life. And I th so I think we have to understand that these uh, procedures are done on a, a different population that has uh, different um, 
uh, social uh, issues that are, would affect uh, the, the ability to really um, obtain high quality um, randomized uh, information. But, but um, I think we have to be you know, imaginative in the way we look at all the data um, and look at all the different sources of data that we can. Um, I think the um, presentation from um, Picori was um, very uh, enlightening about all the different ways that we can uh, look at data to make the most uh, intelligent coverage decisions uh, for these surgeries. Uh, this is Dr. Zuckerman. I, I guess I'm uh, struck by not wanting to be imaginative. Um, as uh, trained in epidemiology, I like to look at data and I, I'm very concerned about the lack of data. Um, I very, well, a couple of issues that have been raised. One is um, the lack of, the loss of, loss to follow up that's huge. I mean, we're, we're supposed to be looking at two years or less or more than two years. And some of the data that I've looked at, um, actually all the data that I looked at for um, what seems to be the Medicare population uh, showed a, a very large loss to follow up. I mean, if you lose more than half your people after 18 months, that's not good. And how do you make decisions based on data like that? And the other part of this is that although I understand that a lot of these Medicare patients are disabled, I want to know who these people are. Why are they disabled? Did they become overweight because they were already disabled? Are they disabled because they're so overweight? I mean, we know nothing about them, and how do we make any kind of judgment about how well they're likely to do, knowing that they could be very, very different from the other um, patients in the same age group? We just don't know. So I'm frustrated by that. I also just want to mention something about exclusion criteria. I know that when um, gastric banding was first approved by the FDA, the studies excluded people with a family history of autoimmune disease. And they did that because of concern about reaction to the band. And since uh, African American women are particularly vulnerable to autoimmune diseases like lupus and so on, that, that means that they were excluded from studies. I don't know if that's true of other, um, you know, of the balloon or other uh, devices, but I know that traditionally it's not unusual to exclude people. Uh, for reasons like that, and that really raises questions about how generalized, generalizable the data are. So I'm really struck by the lack of information and how, how hard it is to vote, uh, even on the question of short-term versus long-term, when we're missing uh, subgroup analyses where we haven't heard any presentations about exclusion criteria. We know that generally in clinical trials, um, there's a desire to um, have healthier, younger people, and that they often are white. And in this case, unusually, they're mostly women. And, um, and the other part of that is it sounds like we're going to have wonderful data. It sounds like there are some huge data sets that could be looked at with these subgroup analyses that could be looked at long term, that could make a, give us a lot more information about who these people are and what's happening to them, and we just don't have it yet. Uh, Dr. Yates, the, um, I'd like to thank all the speakers for all the hard work and the wonderful presentations they made today. And I, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to this. Um, surgery is a science of accretion of knowledge. It's not a science that is out of randomized controlled trials. It's a science of accretion and experience. As the chairman of uh, Vanderbilt was famously quoted once, Son, you don't have to learn about all your, own, all your own mistakes by doing them. You can read about a few of them. And over time, surgery grows from that accretion of knowledge. And it is very hard to do sham surgery. It's very hard to do randomized controlled trials in surgery. And my hat's off to those that have uh, completed those. And as such, we have to accept surgical literature for what it is, which is um, something different than what, say, the McMaster's group expects in terms of level one and level two evidence. Um, I think the answer was, it's very enlightening how very robust the registry is and its development, and I think that's very important, and I think it's very important 
that CMS support the registry uh, accumulation of data uh, and that we learn how to somehow give credit to registry data such that it rises to the level of level one and two. And if it becomes universal in terms of its application, then capturing patients lost to follow up because they may move or they, something happens, the, the registries are going to hunt those down a lot better than a study that's only funded for two or three years. And so those are my comments. I think that the evidence is what it is and we have to work with what we have in terms of uh, what can only be a less than level one experience. Renee Williams, NYU. I um, want to thank the presenters again. Essentially, I think we have a lot of good data, but I also think we have a lot of missing data. Um, so we'll, I think we just have to use our best judgment in terms of making our decisions today. I really appreciate having the patient perspective in terms of bias, and I think the thing that surprised me the most today was the fact that um, there is no coverage for, I guess, services following bariatric surgery. That is something that I actually didn't know, and um, that was very, I guess, enlightening for me. Uh, Marcel Salib, NIH. So I, I enjoyed the meeting. I think, um, you know, Medicare was able to cover a number of bariatric procedures, and I was part of the coverage team in 2006 on that decision memo. And, uh, you know, I didn't hear a lot of uh, complaints about that memo, surprisingly, but um, I heard a lot of, of in, on other topics in the past. Uh, I believe we did conclude at that time that there was uh, useful evidence pertaining to the Medicare population. Um, I think this progress since then is actually quite considerable. Um, and I think that the, um, the quality programs need to, um, you know, take charge and be, be a real quality program. Um, and you, the quality programs can, I think, do audits of their data and do make sure that they have completeness of the cases at, from the surgeons, which I think is really a key issue that people have been touching on. And it doesn't have to be the responsibility of the payer to do that. I think, um, you know, if you, if you are a quality program looking at surgical outcomes, um, you know, those, those missing data are very important to really shrink them down and um, look, look very critically. I think the progress shown from the data that we saw over time is, is remarkable and, and excellent. And, you know, I think the point is well taken that there is a large um, group of people who are not getting surgery. I think that's um, partly a patient choice is involved partly in that. So I think that's um, also more of a societal problem, and we can um, look at that. So I do think that um, a troubling point to me is sort of this lack of really shared decision making on how to choose a procedure and um, how to treat obesity in, in the population. Um, the it seems like uh, people, you know, I understand the skills and history and regional specialization, but I think that there is some need for more of a shared decision-making approach to this. Thanks. Dan Allendorf with ICER. I do also want to thank uh, all of the presenters uh, and um, those who put a lot of work into the research that informed this meeting. Um, I'm going to be echoing a lot of the comments that, that were already made in, in some ways, but, but maybe not so in others. Um, as uh, an evidence reviewer, I'm heartened to see um, some incremental gains in uh, additional long-term follow-ups since we did our own uh, technology assessments for the state of Washington and for the California Technology Assessment Forum a couple of years ago. Um, and as an evidence reviewer, um, my esteemed colleagues at Brown, I feel your pain in terms of trying to really get the, the entry criteria right. Um, I think as Dr. Zuckerman notes, we don't really know a lot about uh, what the Medicare disabled population looks like. And so whether that is at all comparable to 
uh, the larger set of lower age studies for bariatric surgery remains an open question. So, but I'd prefer to, to highlight another observation that Drs. Tricolinos and Haneyotu, if I got that right, um, alluded to, which is that, yes, we have these large studies that are ongoing, PCORnet, society registries, they look very robust and very promising, but there were observational studies, comparative observational studies, um, that the Brown Group looked at. Less than 20% of them made any attempt to control for confounding between groups. So there are some basic building blocks of observational study that can be applied in any clinical discipline, including this one, and um, have not really been applied with uh, the same level, like, level of rigor that I'm used to seeing. And so um, we do not necessarily need randomized controlled trials to answer many of these questions, but what we do need is a commitment to good rigorous science. Mark Mora from Kaiser Permanente. Uh, once again, thank you for um, all the expertise and experience in the room. It's reassuring to see how the field continues to advance and how our knowledge continues to expand. One thing that I thought I'd hear more about was the sort of system approach to managing this chronic condition, uh, behavioral modifications and the behavioral health issues that many of these patients face, the medical management issues, lifestyle, as well as the surgical approach. I think that's just an opportunity uh, for us to get better at uh, providing care for these patients. Um, and I, once again, would just comment on the experience and expertise in the room, and it's really impressive to hear from all of you. So thank you for your time today. Doug Campus, I'll call it Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so I've been on a number of these um, panels now, and I've also participated in a lot of clinical practice guideline panels. And I, I would say that it's very common to have the specialist disagree with the generalist and the methodologist as to the quality of the evidence. The, the specialists almost always feel that the evidence they have is better than the, the methodologists feel that it is. So that's, it's not unusual to be in that situation. Um, the, uh, I would like to reiterate the comment about randomized control trials. I hear this over and over again. We, we can't do randomized control trials. We don't, you don't need randomized control trials to have good quality evidence. You need good quality observational studies. And, that, and I don't see those here. I see observational studies, but has been mentioned, they have methodological flaws that keep them from being upgraded to high quality. And that's something which, if you admit that you, you can't really do randomized controlled trials, fine. Then let's strive to make your observational studies the highest quality you can. And that means you've got to control for confounders and effect modifiers and so forth. Um, the other thing to remember is we're not being asked to make a coverage decision here. What we're being asked is to assess the quality of the evidence. What is the evidence here? Medicare makes the decision on coverage. And I've been in panels where the panel didn't think the evidence was very good, but, but a coverage decision was made. Anyway, a lot of times coverage with evidence development. So we're being asked to assess the evidence and not make a coverage decision. And that's, uh, those two may not be consistent. I may transparently say, I don't think the evidence is very good and secretly wish we were covering something. But that's not what I'm being asked to do. Karen Albright, UAB. Um, I guess I would echo um, my colleagues' comments um, so far, uh, particularly the last comments. Um, I would say specifically I was hoping in terms of observational research that we would see um, at least moderate, if, if not larger, efforts to uh, achieve balance between groups, um, whether that's um, inverse probability weighting or propensity score matching, and then to have the statistics actually uh, fit with that study design to make sure that we're using, you know, uh, paired statistics if, if that's what's needed. Um, and I would only add that in terms of evidence, I would have liked to hear uh, more about functional outcomes, um, life space, things that matter to patients, and um, a little more granular data on the, on the burden of disease. You know, do you or do you not cross this A1C line um, to have diabetes? But in fact, you know, um, some speakers brought up the importance of prior insulin use. Also, I would argue it's important the duration of your disease or the severity of your disease. So burden of disease is, is something I think was also lacking. 
Okay, I'll close up, Alistair J. Again, I'm going to put on my public health hat and go up to about 30,000 feet. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of unanswered questions that we need to answer, but I was having a conversation at, at lunch, and you can go back to Ansel Keys' seven country study, which is almost 70 years old now. Uh, you can talk about the Honolulu Heart Study. Uh, some of the epidemiology data has been published by Paul Zimmer in Australia, which refers to the colonization of diets. So the more population shifts from an agrarian diet to a more Western diet, both the incidence and prevalence of diabetes track right along. Um, so I think for all of us in this room, there are questions that need to be answered or continue to be answered in, in terms of what are the best procedures, who are the best patients to recommend those procedures to. But as, as physicians, NCU reps, policy folks, nurses, NPs, PAs, I think we all need to make a larger commitment to the public health side of the equation. Um, so less video games, less fast foods, less television, less computer time. We need to be physically active and, and really make intelligent choices in, in, in our diet. At the end of the day, what we'd like to see is fewer obese people uh, in the Medicare population about which we have to have these, these conversations. So I'd like to thank you all for your participation and input and insights. It's been um, interesting, to say the least. Thank you. So now during this portion of the meeting is when the panel will vote. So if you'll just give us a few seconds, I'm going to hand out the keypads. The panel members, they will vote. Um, Panel members, once Dr. Kujet, he will read all of the question. He will read the question. After he reads the question, then he'll go one by one. You will cast your vote. Your vote will show up on the screen. Remember, the last vote that you push on the um, key device will be your vote. After all the votes are in and we get the, the mean up on the screen, Dr. Kujet will call each individual person and you will say your vote. Could you please state your name and then say your vote so that it could be heard for the record? And also, don't forget, you do have a pre-score sheet in your folder as well to record your vote. Okay? Just need one second. I have a question about um, the first set of questions. I just want to make sure I understand that this is a question of these should be appropriate. These are that we consider these appropriate outcome measures. Is that I think that's right. yes. not not that they've been proven to be, but that we believe that they should be considered. The, the voting question basically just to, to, to assess our confidence in the data that was presented that addresses each, each of the questions. Um, I, I can't hear you. Sorry. I oh. couldn't hear you. The voting questions are an assessment of what our confidence is in the level of data that were presented to address each, each of these questions. What happens after we do this? Goes okay, down, I thought that was true for line. two and three, but and four, but I thought one was different. Am, am I wrong? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that question one is how, uh, co how confident are we that these are outcomes that should be looked at? Yeah. Not that were looked at or that there was evidence that they should be looked at. Okay. How important do we feel Thank these you. are as outcomes to be explored? That's my interpretation of that question. So also I have a point on this question. Um, the primary outcome is, you know, generally viewed as most important, and uh, you know that I found that in the literature. There's also, I believe, an FDA view of primary outcome is used for um, making regulatory decisions, and and I think scientifically they're used for calculating the size of a trial. Um, there are other types of outcomes like secondary outcomes, and so 
um, to me, if it's for decision making on coverage, you know, that, that would be why it would be a primary outcome here in this meeting. Um, and so, you know, to me, some of these, I wouldn't want to make coverage decisions based on these, some of these ones listed in question one. I would not be confident making coverage decisions based on bariatric surgery based on some of these outcomes. Okay. But as, as we said before, we're not making that recommendation in terms of coverage decisions, but we are making a recommendation on based on our score from one low confidence to five to high confidence. And, a, and question one is basically seven questions because each of the different parts. So if you think the data presented is convincing. I think we have to decide what that question yeah. is. Yeah. Because I, uh, I interpret that as missing a word or two, and it's how confident are you that the following is meaningful primary health outcome as available in research studies from bariatric surgery of, I mean, is, this is a question, I mean, it's not us trying to tell people no, what we, to. We had a conference research. call about the, the we, need, we need a CMS maybe. consult here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So yes, it's a meaningful health health outcome. That's not health. What is it? I couldn't hear you, Joe. I think the distinction we're trying to draw with our questions about this question <laughs> is: are, are we expressing confidence that these outcomes have been addressed in the available evidence, or are we expressing our level of confidence that these are outcomes that should be measured? in studies should, should be measured. Okay. okay. And do you want to distinguish between primary as a few most important ones so that you can't have all of them be primary outcomes? I mean, do you want us to distinguish between like the most, the three most important or the two most important or? No, no just wait. So, so unless you disagree, so we've put down primary. Marcel has has laid it out. I don't believe if you want to go that far, uh, that's fine. If you want to discuss other issues with it, I believe, uh, Dr. Couget, you can ask those questions. But I would ask the question first to vote on as, as we have it. Does that make sense? Yeah. That was the original discussion when we had the yeah. phone conference. Yeah, yes, and then if you want, if, then after you ask that question and vote, you can ask are there any comments on it. So, all right, question, question one. Shit. How confident are you that the following are meaningful primary health outcomes in research studies of bariatric surgery? First issue we're going to address is the data regarding weight loss. And one. Those yep. Everyone should have their okay. keypad so you can go ahead and vote. Okay. Should we see a light on it? Hmm? Green light. Green. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the second question is how confident. One second. We're not, we, have yeah, no. yeah. we need everyone to push the keypad one more time. We're missing two people's vote. Wait, push one more time. If everyone could just push the button one more time, just push one it more. real hard. <laughs> so we there we go, we got one more. Um, we're missing one vote. Everybody press again. It's buzzing like it wants me to do something, but there's no green light when I press. Ah. That's the defect. Oh, mine's buzzing too, and I don't see a light either. Where's the lights? Can you just press it one more time? <laughs> Okay. Dr. Zuckerman, can you press yours as well? Yep, I have. Where's, where's the light supposed to show up? Up in the right hand. Upper right. Oh, I'm not getting Above any the light, three. but I'm getting lots of buzz. <laughs> you want me to do it again? Yes, if everyone could just push the button one more time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's my problem. Yeah. Yeah. Let me try that again. We're still missing one, so somebody's pad is not working. I don't see a light. No. Yeah, it's buzzing. I don't see a light, though.
this, I don't think so. But one of us is working. We're just not sure who. It's an instrument. This is going to be the control stuff. The electrics? All right, so <clears throat> second area is post-operative complications. So how confident are you that the following are meaningful primary health outcomes in research studies of bariatric surgery based on what, what was presented today? Dr. Zuckerman's as well. Well, I'll do mine. I wrote it twice. If everyone could just push your buttons one more time, just to make sure. Um, I apologize that we're having technical difficulties. So what we're going to do is we will vote. Oh, there it is. Something happened. <laughs> okay, we will start with Dr. Karen Albright, if you could, because we forgot to say our votes for the question one. So could you state your vote for question one and question two, please? So 1A, 1B? Yes, I'm sorry, 1, 1A and 1B, thank you. <laughs> okay, Karen Albright, UAB, uh, 1A, 5, 1B, 4. Thank you. Yeah, Doug Campus, I'll call 1A, 3, 1B, 5. Mark Mora, uh, 1A, 4, 1B, 4. Dan Ollendorf, uh, 5 for both 1A and 1B. Marcel Salive, five for one A and one B. 
Renee Williams, 5 for 1A and 1B. Adolf Yates, 5, 1A, 1B. Diana Zuckerman, 5 for 1A and 1B. Bob Hilkert, uh, 5 for 1A and 4 for 1B. Martha Betts, 5 for 1A and 5 for 1B. Sam Klein, 5, 1A, 5, 1B. Dana Tallum, 5, 1A, uh, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Dana Tellum, 5-1-A and 5-1-B. Uh, Bruce Wolf, 1-A-5, uh, 1-B-4. One one Thank okay. you. Hopefully we're moving on to question 1-C. Uh, how confident are you that the following are meaningful primary health outcomes in research studies of bariatric surgery, C, diabetes, and metabolic outcomes? Yeah, whatever you Okay. Karen Albright, UAB. One, one second. John, this is done the last time. Could you use the statement? We're still missing one. Right. Real. We're still missing one. Yeah. We're still missing the one. Real response, a continuous buzz. Okay. I, it's, it's intermittent. I, mean, I don't think I have a good audience response yeah, yeah, card here. I'm a man, I use a remote control at home. I know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> is there any way we can identify which keypad is not functioning? I think we've got it narrowed down to two. One of two. It just, it just, do you have another one? This is it. Yeah, it's this one. Yeah, try to show me up. <laughs> Can I download an app? <laughs> I apologize for the inconvenience. We're going to see if we can get another keypad. Are, are the keypads mandatory? Couldn't we just go down and give our vote and somebody tally it up and do a quick me? We could do that. Yeah. Okay. In the mean, okay. In the meantime, what we will do is, we are on question one C. If you could go down the line and state your vote. Okay. Karen Albright, UAB four. Doug Campbell, I'll call it five. You guys are quick. Mark Mora four. <laughs> Dan Ollendorf five. Marcel Salee five. Renee Williams five. Adolf Yates, five. Diana Zuckerman, five. Bob Hilkert, four. Martha Betts, five. Sam Klein, five. Dana Tellum, five. Bruce Wolf, five. Okay, thank okay. you. Let's move on to question D. How confident are you that the following are meaningful primary health outcomes in research studies of bariatric surgery as they pertain to cardiovascular outcomes? Karen Albright, UAB, four. Doug Campbell, out, call it five. Mark Mora, four. Dan Ollendorf, five. Cardio Bass, yeah. Marcel Salib, one. Rennie Williams, five. Yates, five. And you please respell my name. It's a PH at the end of Adolf. Um, Diana Zuckerman, three. Bob Hilkert, four. Martha Betts, five. Sam Klein, five. Dana Tellum, five. Bruce Wolf, four. Respiratory. 
want? Yes, so we can move on. Yes, we can go on. All right. So part E, how confident are you that the following are meaningful primary health outcomes in research studies of bariatric surgery as they pertain to respiratory outcomes? Just need one second. Everyone has voted. Okay. Now, if you could go down the line and state your vote. Karen Albright, four. Doug Capisalco, five. Mark Moore, three. Dan Ollendorf, two. Marcel Salib, one. Renee Williams, five. Yates, five. Diana Zuckerman, two. Bob Hilkert, two. Martha Betts, three. Sam Klein, five. Dana Tellum, four. Bruce Will, four. Okay, one F. <clears throat> How confident are you that the following are meaningful primary health outcomes in research studies of bariatric surgery as they pertain to musculoskeletal outcomes? We're just going to, if you could, because the system is acting up, we have nine voters when we only have eight. If you could just say your vote and don't worry about the, the device at this time. Thank you. Karen Albright, four. Campus out call, five. Mark Mora, three. Dan Ollendorf, two. Marcel Salive, one. Renee Williams, four. EH, five. Diana Zuckerman, three. Bob Hilkert, two. Martha Betts, three. Sam Klein, five. Dana Tellum, four. Bruce Wolf, four. Okay, last part of uh, question one. How confident are you that the following are meaningful primary health outcomes in research studies of bariatric surgery as they pertain to quality of life? Karen Albright, four. Campus out call, four. Mark Mora, four. Dan Ollendorf, five. Marcel Salib, three. Rennie Williams, five. Yates, five. Diana Zuckerman, three. Bob Hilkert, three. Martha Betts, four. Sam Klein, five. Dana Tellum, five. Ruth Wolf, four. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Let's move on to question two. How confident are you that there is sufficient evidence for an intervention, open parenthesis, to include open and laparoscopic surgeries and endoscopic procedures, close parenthesis, where the benefit outweighs the harm for, A, short term, two years or less from surgery weight loss? Karen Albright, four. Campus yeah, Alcult, three. Mark Mora, three. Dan Ollendorf, four. Marcel Salib, five. Rennie Williams, five. Yates, five. Diana Zuckerman, three. Bob Hilkert, four. Martha Betts, four. Sam Klein, five. Dana Tellum, five. Uh, Wolf, five. Okay. <clears throat> Part B, how confident are you that there is sufficient evidence for an intervention where the benefit outweighs the risk, the harm for midterm, defined as more than two, but five or less from surgery, weight loss? Albright, three. Campus out, call three. Mark Mora, three. 
Ohlendorf, three. Marcel Salee, four. Williams, five. Yates, five. Diana Zuckerman, one. Hilkert, three. Martha Betts, three. Klein, five. Tallum, five. Wolf, five. Okay. Um, again, same question. Benefit versus harm. Benefit outweighs the harm for long term, more than five years after surgery, weight loss. Albright, three. Kevin out call it one. Mark Mora, dose, two. <laughs> Ollendorf, one. Marcel Salib, three. Rennie Williams, four. Yates, five. Diana Zuckerman, one. Hilkert, two. Martha Betts, two. Klein, five. Talon, four. Wolf, five. Okay, question three. <clears throat> this is a response where if the score is greater than 2.5, um, question is, for those outcomes listed in question one, and that includes weight loss, post-operative complications, diabetes and metabolic outcomes, cardiovascular outcomes, respiratory outcomes, muscular cell outcomes, and three, and last, quality of, of life. Are any of those below 2.5? You don't do weight loss. We have to answer after. these. I think. Yes. Which one was two, <laughs> quality of life? Well, the forms we're turning in only have the one box. Yeah. It's going to be tough. You don't do weight loss. Though. Sorry, what was the do you have tabulation? Oh, goodness. I was wondering. I'm sorry, I'm not that one. I don't know. It's going to sound like it was the one you voted for. So we need, so do we we need, need to calculate its score. Yeah, do yeah. we do it for each one individually, each of those outcomes individually, or they all well, any it's not, it's, of it's, them? The question is you have to have a voting score of each category for greater than 2.5. So we need a tabulation. Right, but, right. but, uh, but on our forms, it's all, it's, mm -hmm. has, has been stated, it's more, just it's, one it's time question. opportunity yeah. for short-term, mid-term, yeah. or long-term, and there's not specific ones for each thing to write on our yellow sheet. We could use the average score this is and then vote on the collective of that. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is if we had, it, we could do it separately on the, on the machine if it were working, but if we have to do it on our written right. form. And looking at the scores, basically a lot of the scores were high, they were three, or above, we only had a couple ones. So it doesn't appear that any of them are less than 2.5. So what we will do is we will vote on all of them. Okay, so let me reread the As question. one vote, just as one vote, not like as individual. As a composite? As a composite. Okay. It's, it's, it's a time frame question. Is the effect gonna be beneficial to you or less? But there's a real difference in terms of whether the data presented deal with well, how much. This, this question could be better phrased. But acknowledging that, let's just answer what, you, what based on the, what the presentations you heard today. Um, so we're going to answer all seven of those parameters uh, in, in question one. Just one so thing, then, though. Marcel yeah. pointed out that question two already deals with weight loss because it's stated in the question. Okay. So that means that it's B through G that we should be addressing in question three. I can hear. So question two already states weight loss right which is 1a so what we're really talking about in question three is 1b through g we don't have to do this guy again. that's probably two. did it here uh, right 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 no. and they were higher than they were so than 2.5 should we just write them in then so they all look like question two You, so we should write it all in well, for six or however four, many. Four in question, the weight, weight, weight loss should be a given based on the scoring from the first, first question. So it, it should we're be not a good point. Eight. No, that one's done. Yeah, we're not voting for weight loss, but there are six other ones. Are no, we I'm voting saying, separately 
for each of those three things for six different outcome measures. If the score was greater than 2.5. So Is that what you want us to do, or do you want us to vote once saying at least one of these things we're confident of? I think the intent of the question was to address them in aggregate, not individually. Oh, in aggregate. Well, yeah, do we have any direction from CMS on this? Aggregate, please. Aggregate. So question three is for those outcomes listed in question one with a voting score greater than 2.5, how confident are you that there is sufficient evidence for an intervention to include open and laparoscopic surgeries and endoscopic procedures where the benefit outweighs the harm for short term, again defined as two years or less from surgical intervention outcomes? Albright, four. Campus alcohol, two. For question 3A, uh, Mark Mora votes three. Ollendorf, four. So leave to? Uh, 3A, five. Uh, Williams. Yates, 3A, five. Zuckerman, two. Hilkert, four. Martha Betts, two. Klein, five. Tell him five. Wolves, five. Again, for those outcomes listed in question one, with the voting score greater than 2.5, how confident are you that there is sufficient evidence for an intervention to include open and laparoscopic surgeries and endoscopic procedures where the benefit outweighs the harm for Midterm defined as more than two, but less than five from surgical outcomes. Albright, three. Campus alcohol, two. Mark Moore, I have intermediate confidence in three. Ollendorf, two. Salib, two. Williams, four. Yates, five. Zuckerman, one. Hilkert, two. Martha Betts, two. Klein, five. Talon, five. Wolf, five. Okay, question three, part C. This is long term outcomes more than five years after surgery or intervention. Albright, three. Campus out called two. Mark Mora, two. Ollendorf, one. Salib, one. Williams, three. Yates, five. Zuckerman, one. Hilkert, two. Martha Betts, two. Klein, five. Tell him, four. Wolf, five. All right. Um, Question four, how confident are you that the predictors of success in the Medicare population, such as patient characteristics and pre and post procedure standards of care for any bariatric surgery therapy is known? Albright, two. Campus out, call it one. Mark Mora, two. Ollendorf, one. Salib, one. Williams, three. Question four, four for Yates. Zuckerman, one. Hilkert, two. Betts, two. Klein, one. Talon, three. Wolf, four. Okay, and we're gonna have some discussion. The voting's completed, but we'd like the panel's opinion what the predictors of success and the corresponding strength of evidence. Um, for bariatric procedures and surgeries. Can you want to start? Uh, so to that comment, I would say that um, I felt I got more information from the reading list um, than the presentations today. Maybe it was me, maybe it was the focus of the presentations, but um, I don't know that 
I feel confident in what those predictors are or that I could speak to them intelligently. Okay. Yeah, I, I voted one, so I don't think I can answer this, this question. I, I think that um, I didn't see any evidence that um, we could predict. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I think I'll just hearken back to the technology assessment. So there were some models out there. Most of them were not validated. Um, I think we already know that there, we, there's a disconnect between what's been published in terms of um, bariatric surgery in the Medicare eligible population and what's actually happening on the ground in terms of who's getting the surgery. So um, I think there's just a need for more evidence to be generated uh, in the relevant population uh, and then more predictive work done. Yeah, I agree with that. No comment. We're on number four, and this is Yates. Um, in the Medicare age population, traditional Medicare age population, there was a lack of evidence in that population, but I thought four was applicable only because the average age of overall Medicare population is uh, easily uh, uh, represented by the surrogate data from younger patients out of Medicare. And in particular, I thought type of procedure, gender, age, and collective markers for metabolic syndrome were all very predictive from the uh, nice review from uh, uh, Dr. Pagano and uh, Dr. Uh, Ticolanis. Okay, um, uh, yeah, I voted one because I thought that it wasn't clear how well we could predict among the medic care population and especially the disabled because it's, I did not make the assumption that Medicare patients who are on Medicare because of disability are similar to non-Medicare patients of the same age range. I just felt we had no data to say that was true or not true. Um, yeah, I agree with everyone on the panel. I, you know, I'd like to see some good, you know, subgroup analyses so that we can really begin to understand who benefits the most from this, you know, surgery. Seems like it's just you know, sort of all takers and everyone with a certain BMI should have this surgery and I'm not sure the, that's really the right answer. Martha Betts, no comment. So I think most of the data actually probably include a Medicare type of population even though the percentage of Medicare patients are low. There might not be much different between those who are not on Medicare versus those who are on Medicare in terms of disabilities in the, and the age groups. What, what is lacking though is the older age group. We have very little data in people age 65 and over. Only one paper that I saw was presented today but not yet published by Chris Still. All the other data is age 60 or 55 and above. And so I think that's really lacking and coming up with some guidelines uh, regarding how to choose in the older adult population who is safe to have the operation and who will benefit from the operation. I voted three. I think more data are needed, but I did think that there was some generalizability that could be applied to the Medicare population around procedure choice, gender, uh, socioeconomic status, and race ethnicity. Uh, I voted uh, four. Th what, this question really needs better definition as to what is success, uh, and more information about patient reported outcomes will be uh, important here because what uh, I or uh, you might call success may or may not be what the patient uh, calls success, uh, but uh, you know, so overall, I, I think the success rate is very high, and that's why I voted for. I'm going to add. I mean, traditional predictors of better outcomes are social, economic status, educational status, family support, geographic location. And Dr. Demaria said, he, as an experienced bariatric surgeon, he, he has not operated on folks over the age of what 70 was it? Or 75? 75. I don't know that that same conclusion applies to 80 or 85. It depends more on their physiologic status. And that's one of the questions we need to answer going, going forward, um, particularly as, as the surgical procedures become more and more refined with, with fewer complications. So that's, that's an area for, for discussion and exploration going forward. Um, it just occurred to me that it wasn't clear to me that if a patient wasn't on Medicare, uh, sorry, wasn't on disability and therefore not on Medicare because of disability, um, that they'd even have health insurance if they were in their 
30s or 40s, so I just wondered if that is an inherent difference between the, one, the people in the clinical trials and the population we're concerned with. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we'd like the thoughts on, on important evidence gaps that have not been previously or sufficiently addressed. We just mentioned one of them. What's the cut point for age? Um, what else do people think? We need more information and, and evidence. Uh, I'd be happy to address, address that. We're very anxious to uh, fine tune uh, the candidates as well as the interventions. We heard about a, a wide range of interventions from endoscopic to uh, major surgical. Um, uh, I've chaired the labs consortium, the NIH consortium for the last 12 years and we've made a great effort to uh, provide the data so we can have better personalized care. Exactly. Uh, and we've not been particularly successful in identifying uh, the, you know, the weight loss is highly variable. We have trouble predicting that. Um, the diabetes remits in 60 percent. Uh, we have some clues on how to uh, predict whether that will occur or not that we heard about today, but it's incomplete. Um, so uh, more data to specifically allow us to predict outcomes of specific indications for surgery among specific patients will be helpful. And, and I would add, we'd had to, we've heard some information about A1Cs coming down and people coming off medications, but we don't know the duration of the effect and we don't know which <coughs> populations are going to have the best outcomes over a long, longer time frame. So um, that's a pertinent issue because uh, what should the endpoint be regarding diabetes? Is it remission? Is it better control? Is it long-term complications? Uh, is it survival? Um, it could be um, any of those, but uh, certainly the Stampede trial, which is probably the most celebrated, the endpoint is A1C, uh, is not remission because the entry criterion was absolutely uncontrolled diabetes. If that's your population, uh, then the remission rate will be low. Uh, whereas in the Labs 3 diabetes trial, uh, insulin was an exclusion, so the remission rate is 92 percent. Uh, so it depends a great deal on what's the uh, entry criteria. Okay. I, I would uh, just append to that. Um, there's kind of a general call out there for these so-called core outcome sets, standardized measures. And so even if we're thinking that remission is a good outcome to measure, we heard about four or five different definitions of it today. So we'd want to think about how to standardize those measures. I think the same thing would apply for post-operative complications. In other surgeries, there are standard classification systems. Look at severity. You can do the same thing here. Okay. All right. Second part is discuss any known treatment disparities. Um, I'll go back to the classic cabbage study in Medicare populations where black men had poor outcomes despite the same insurance coverage and the same procedures. Um, and as, as a trialist in the past, I would encourage future studies be very inclusive in, in the populations uh, that are enrolled in, in, in the study. So we have some good information. We've heard black women tend to have poor outcomes. I heard that. I forget who said that. Um, but we need to make a real effort um, to, to try and understand the, the treatment differences among different populations at, at risk. I'd like to add to that. I think. The group has done a nice job of noticing that there's this um, predominantly, it's predominantly women, and so supplementing with VA data to get men. And if you could do the same for ancestry or uh, race, ethnicity, then we would know more about the people that we're actually caring for. Any other comments? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that the diversity um, is really important, but also the subgroup analysis. If you've got diversity, but you mush everybody together, and most of them are white women, then it's, gonna, it's going to um, hide any differences and um, make it harder to know, um, you know who's benefiting the most and who isn't benefiting much at all, and whether certain people are at greater risk uh, of having the risks outweigh the benefits. I, I, let me just make one other comment because I had a conversation with Joe at Glasky. He's not here anymore. Um, we don't often. Are you back there? There you go. About we don't turn the mirror back and look at ourselves. Um, so I was asking him about the implicit association test 
I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, it's a test up at Harvard that's been validated among a bunch of different domains. Um, so I did the obesity implicit associating test because I wanted to look at the data being presented, not having my biases filter what I'm hearing or, 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 or seeing. And I think sometimes when we look at the disparities issue, we need to take a look at us as providers and how we interact with our patients and what we, what we, we mentioned conversations in some of the presentations, but there are conversations and there are conversations. So that's just, just a, a secondary thought, but it does contribute to differences in outcomes. <laughs> Um, just as a patients. comment, I, I do think it's very important to have a diverse sample and make a concerted effort to recruit um, a diverse population. I mean, I'm not sure what happens here in other research studies. Certain populations are not getting, you know, maybe certain populations aren't getting recommended bariatric surgery as an option, and I don't know if there's data on that or not. But I think by doing that, we'd have a much more comprehensive view of the data. Yeah, and uh, I would add that, you know, we worry a lot about access in our field, and uh, I think that one of the things that has to be looked at and is available through Medicare because they have zip code data is the uh, AHRQ uh, poverty index that can be generated from administrative data sets and look at access to uh, bariatric surgery and also using those uh, zip codes you can calculate urban versus rural uh, because there's very very different types of uh, poverty and rural poverty in Appalachia and rural poverty uh, in, in a bad part of town are both poverty and both have barriers to access. Okay. The complexity is challenging. Uh, we started examining the Medicaid population uh, as our first uh, disparity in the labs analysis and immediately we discovered that the Medicaid population is very different. Um, older, heavier, a much greater comorbidity uh, burden uh, so to just to compare the outcomes at a given point in time um, doesn't adequately take into account where you started. Uh, the same could be true for the rural or um, Medicare and so forth. So these are all important subpopulations which will be part of enabling us to do better personalized care. Uh, and what we mostly have is generalized data of the entire population, uh, which uh, is useful but doesn't completely resolve the question. And uh, when we think of barriers to care, I think we need to remember it's not just patient barriers, but physician barriers also exist too. Okay. So that has to be taken into consideration. Okay, the last piece of this is considering both existing and new procedures and devices as well as potential barriers to care. Discuss any mechanisms that might be supported by CMS that would more quickly generate an improved evidence base that would underpin improved care and decision making for the Medicare population affected by obesity. Uh, Dr. Yates. Dr. Yates speaking. Um, two things that Medicare CMS could help with. One would be, and this is a tough one, is to harmonize the coverage policies for bariatric surgery amongst the administrative contractors and the Medicare Advantage organizations so that apples are apples when people go to look for bariatric surgery. Um, there's a lot of, um, anyway, I'll leave, I'll leave local cover determination debates for later. Uh, That's called getting national coverage. Well, it's called, it's called <laughs> smoothing out the LCDs. But uh, the, the second thing would be, the second thing would be to any, any kind of care to stick or if, even if it's a, a value-based purchasing process that requires bariatric surgery programs to be part of registry data, uh, especially those that are um, validated, would be very important. And I think that the evidence for that is clearly um, uh, cl is is clearly seen from the requirement for um, cardiothoracic programs to be part of SDS, as well as what's being generated out of NISQIP by the requirement that any surgical training program has to be part of NISQIP, and anything that can get bariatric surgery across the board covered makes registry data more robust and more real. Okay. Any any other comments? I yeah. want. Sorry, I want to second the belonging to a registry as part of a bariatric program and the importance of that data capture and being able to provide true long-term outcomes that will help benefit the patients and that any program performing bariatric surgery, whether it's freestanding and doing endoscopic procedures or surgical procedures, should be required to report into a registry. Well, one of the things we heard today was about data collection. And the more information we have, the better you can design trials and the better decisions you, you can make based, based on the outcomes. Um, 
It's a given that the surgical and, and laparoscopic techniques are going to continue to evolve. So they're going to get better. We just needed to find the population, that the Medicare population, that is going to most benefit uh, from, from the improvements in technique. <clears throat> yeah, I think this is a good example of where coverage with evidence development is, uh, could be very helpful. Uh, because uh, without coverage, we're not going to get the data. That we, that we need in this population. Um, so I, to me, uh, the coverage, the Medicare could help here by, with coverage of some kind, with some kind of parameters, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then collect data over time to see, get some of the answers to the questions you just raised. Okay. Yeah, to build on that, I believe that um, specifically the, the gastric balloon is a good example of that, where the, the evidence we heard was um, not, I would say, compelling to me anyway, on the, some of these endoscopic balloons. And some of the trial evidence is uh, provocative, but the needs probably a little bit of coverage with evidence development to gain enough evidence for full coverage under Medicare. Yeah, great. Yeah, I wanna second that, that I, I thought that the Evidence was just much better for some procedures than others, obviously much better for the ones that have been around longer. And if you want long-term data, you actually have to have something that's been around long-term. Um, but then uh, it, things change. Uh, products change. Even uh, the way surgery is done, it changes. And so it's sometimes very difficult to make sense of data that were collected 10 years ago or five, even five years ago if the patient population is from five to 15 years ago. So I think that's an inevitable barrier, but it is tough. And I think that combined with having analyses that puts all bariatric surgery together instead of looking at specific um, procedures and comparing them makes it very hard to, to make judgments about what's best for whom. Okay, I would like to thank everyone for their participation and presentations, some very interesting information. Um, do we have any housekeeping rules or any other comments? No. Um, I would like to thank everyone also for coming out. Yes, and I'd like to echo that as well. Uh, we have a wealth of information that was discussed today. We have a lot to consider. I thank everybody for their participation. This has been very helpful to us. And uh, thanks again. Safe travels, everyone. All right. I'm going to catch the cab with you guys, if huh? it's okay. If it's, if it's okay, I'm going to follow you guys to get the cab. Oh, I'm looking to follow Maria. <laughs> <laughs>